Magnificent, spectacular, a glorious place. Mistress is one of the most interesting cities in the Peloponnese. Standing still in time, the dead city lies on the slope of the sheer strange hill with the fortress at its top. The whole of Mistress is an open-air museum, a reminder of a glorious era of power and culture. Its fortifications and churches, its palaces and mansions, its roads, fountains and charm offer invaluable insights into the evolution and culture of the Byzantines. The medieval town, which spreads out over the slopes of Tegetos, fills the vision, a lacework pattern of ruins. The life and bustle of the medieval centuries have been frozen into the absolute silence of death, and the stillness is disturbed by nothing noisier than the soup of a hawk. The stones, the walls, the arches and the domes continue to stand in mute existence, and as they crumble and weather away, they take with them what remains of the labour and the skill of the builder, and the remnants of the beliefs and feelings of the people who gave life to them. In other words, of those who created the form inside the space. Much of this medieval city is still standing. The remains include the castle, large sections of the fortification, monasteries and churches, the palace, hundreds of ruined houses and many cobbled streets and arch lanes. In the chapel of St. Christopher, a few fine frescoes have been preserved, including St. Chrysostom enthroned. In the arch, are apostles surrounding the youthful figure of a saint with unruly hair, possibly St. Christopher. St. George's is a gracefully proportioned little building with a lateral adjoining narthex which has been restored. The little monastery of the Perybleptos was built near the southeast corner of the outer wall, directly against a precipitous rock. The plan of the church is not rectangular, because it was compelled to follow the lines of the hollow of the rock into which the church was built. This tower-like building has been called the refectory. The walls are decorated with medallions containing lions and fleur-de-lis. Its architecture couldn't follow the strictest forms and its juxtaposition with the rock deprives it of the surrounding space which its proportions demand. The iconographic arrangement of scenes on the broad surfaces offered by the walls and vaults of the church doesn't present the clarity and simplicity which we find in the older churches, such as the Metropolis, St. Theodore and the Affendico. Here the three iconographic cycles, the Eucharistic, the Feasts and the Passion Scenes and the Life of the Virgin are interwoven. The three apses are decorated with symbolic scenes. These include the Lamb of God, the Communion of the Apostles, the Man of Sorrows, and the Divine Liturgy, and the Sleeping Emmanuel. There are also episodes from the Old Testament. Here we see the Pantocrator, with prophets, the Virgin, and the preparation of the throne. The sculpted decoration of the interior of the building, like most of the churches in Mistress, displays little homogeneity of style or execution. Some details show that we're dealing with fragments taken from elsewhere and adapted to the new church. Churches, monasteries and houses rise from behind the walls. Higher up is the palace, surrounded by more churches and tightly clustered houses, Dominant on the summit stands the citadel. The monastery of the Pantanassa was built in a commanding position on a steep slope on the east side of the mountain. It's the best preserved of all the monuments in Mistras, and the nuns who inhabit it still keep alive the medieval tradition of hospitality. It was founded by John Frangopoulos, the chief minister of Despotat. The western entrance of the monastery, once monumental but no longer standing complete, 
leads into a long narrow court. From there, two steps ascend to a small artificial platform on which the church is built. The capital columns in the interior are of three kinds and are to be dated to different periods. The original wall decoration has survived in fairly good condition in the arms of the cross and in the upper story. The scenes and groups of scenes differ from each other. They have one general characteristic which gives homogeneity to the paintings of the Pantanassa. This is a strongly emphasised mannerism revealed both in the entire composition and in the details of the scenes. Here we see the birth of Christ. The paintings in the Pantanassa are of high quality. They can be dated with reasonable certainty to about 1430. These are a rare surviving example of late Byzantine art. Mistress was also the last centre of Byzantine scholarship to survive before the conquest of the Despotate by the Ottoman Turks in 1460. In the middle town stands the little church of the Evangelistria. The Evangelistria is the only church in Mistras without any recorded history. There are no documents, no inscriptions and no portrait, either of its founder or of the person who rebuilt it. The carvings display a uniformity of style, which proves that they are the original decoration and integral with the church. The complex of buildings which makes up the metropolis lies along the northern inner ridge of the outer wall. The church hasn't preserved its original form, Nikephoros built it as a basilica, the traditional style of cathedral churches. The basilica was divided into three aisles by two rows of three columns each. On the north side of the church is the court in its present form, with porches and colonnades on three sides from the Turkish occupation. Outside is a narrow frieze with examples of sculptures of many different periods and styles. It seems that here too, the old churches of Sparta furnished the architects of Mistress with ready-made material. The museum is in the north courtyard of the metropolis in the building in the west wing and houses sculptures and illuminated manuscripts. In the metropolis, modifications were made rather ineptly its haphazard proportions leaving a ponderous impression. The original interior decoration suffered badly. Matthew, Bishop of Lacedaemonia, treated the frescoes of Nicophorus, just as the Roman remodeler of the Theatre of Dionysus on the slopes of the Acropolis in Athens, treated the frieze of the scene building. He decapitated the figures. The history of Orthodox church wall painting and mosaics is a very rich one. On the one hand, it reveals tremendous creativity in the church's response to architectural and pastoral changes. On the other hand, it shows how consistently it's been faithful to unchanging spiritual principles. The shapes and spaces created by a church building are an integral part of traditional regimes. It seems that to a large extent, temples have been designed from the inside out. The general form of the houses was determined by the steep and uneven contours of the hill and by the urban character which Mistress acquired. On the fortified side of the hill, the space was small for the flourishing capital of the Despotat, and it didn't afford room for spacious courts and gardens. In only a few cases was there a small court. In the platea of the upper city, a large complex of buildings is preserved. Popular tradition calls them the Palace of the Princess, the Hodegetria was preserved fairly well until the 19th century. In about 1863, most of the columns were removed, resulting in the collapse of the dome and part of the vaults. On the southwest side of the hill, in the district of the palace, but rather higher than the square, stands St. Sophia, 
the palace church and the Catholicon of a small monastery. This church, dedicated to the word of the Father, was identified with the Church of Christ Sudots, the giver of life. The architecture of St. Sophia was influenced by the size and splendor of the Affendico. Here, we see Christ in the apse of the sanctuary and Christ surrounded by angels. St. Sophia is distinguished by its tall, narrow proportions, which emphasize its height, a feature unusual in Byzantine architecture. The church is lit only by a few narrow windows in the dome and from those in the arms of the cross, all high up. St. Sophia has a spacious narthex with a dome. The citadel encloses a flat space and is defended by two circuits, an inner and an outer one. In this area, which is little lower but larger than the inner enclosure, are ruins of houses from the Turkish period. The hillside rock of Mistras drops almost vertically, making the citadel inaccessible. The northwest part of the plateau is higher and is surrounded by a second stronger enclosure wall. The citadel was the chief point of the defensive system and the city walls extended the area which it commanded. For two centuries, Mistress was at the forefront of developments. Its story begins in the mid-13th century, when the Franks were dominant in the Peloponnese. Mistress today is a silent town whose ruins rise up in the west side of the Tacitus, just above the valley in the city of Sparta. Mistress was built at the base of the Pararion Gorge, within a dazzlingly beautiful landscape. The Mistress ruins are divided into three sections, the castle, the upper city, which contains houses and narrow roads surrounding the bishop's palace, and the lower city, which contains houses and monasteries safely protected behind the third wall. Mistress, the wonder of the Morea, was built as an amphitheatre around the fortress erected in 1249 by the Prince of Achaia, William of Vilhadwan. Reconquered by the Byzantines, then occupied by the Turks and the Venetians, the city was abandoned in 1832, leaving only the breathtaking medieval ruins standing in a beautiful landscape. 